Okay, um, continuing with the Schaefer, we're looking at seven reasons why the resurrection took place. The first we saw was because of his divinity. Being the eternal son, it is not possible for him to be held by death. It's just not a possibility, okay? But then, according to his humanity, you've got to understand that he rose from the dead because of God's promise to him as the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, and seed of David. And basically, he needed all... He, he needed Jesus, he needs Jesus, the man, to be alive in order to fulfill all those promises. And that is what we uh, see, that the promises to man are based on the surety of God's word, even if it requires for you to be resurrected to fulfill them. And we see that in Romans 4, where it says that Abraham believed God and didn't look at his own body as dead and the barrenness of Sarah's womb but was counting and firmly persuaded that he, God, who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead would fulfill his promise. And Abraham was believing in resurrection. At the, he was believing in a kind of resurrection that enabled him to give forth, uh, bring forth the seed. But he also believed in resurrection literally when he believed that Isaac would have to be raised from the dead in order for God to fulfill his promises to him. It was a logical conclusion. Well, if he's going to have me kill him, then that means he's going to raise him from the dead because God has said that my seed would possess these lands and that hasn't happened yet. It's that sureness of God's promise that guarantees resurrection to the heirs of the promise. If, the, if, you, if all the promises of God have not been fulfilled for you yet in your lifetime and you die then that means he's going to have to raise you up to fulfill all the promises, and that's how faithful God is. So when it comes to this, him being the seed of David who has yet to sit upon David's throne, he had to be resurrected in order for that promise to be fulfilled. That shows how sure God's promise is. That shows that the anchor of God's word is absolutely trustworthy. How trustworthy is it? It's Death can't stop it. Death cannot stop God from fulfilling his promises to mankind. Shown by Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is the proof that God is faithful to his word and will fulfill everything that he has promised. His word will not return to him void, but he will accomplish that which he is sent to do. Now, how does that apply to me and my Christian life? Well, Galatians talks about how we are to live not by perfecting ourselves according to the flesh and perfecting, uh, like trying to become more holy by incrementally getting better by law keeping to try to help God. No, we are to wait on God who gives life to the dead to supply us with the spirit and fulfill the hope of righteousness in us. Fruit bearing, you want to see yourself be fruitful, right? Of course, we all want to be fruitful. Um, and we all have all kinds of foolishness and stuff in our flesh that we wish we didn't have. But when you try to help God by cleaning up your act and minding your P's and Q's, thinking that you're adding to holiness by doing that, or that those things are fruit, you're basically producing an Ishmael. That's what uh, the argument in he, uh, Galatians 4 is, is that, you know, Ishmael represented Abraham's attempt to try to help God in the flesh to fulfill God's promise. So he went into the Hagar, the bondwoman, and had Ishmael and tried to raise him as the heir. But that, he says, is a picture of Sinai and the law, and it engenders children to bondage that then persecute the children of the promise. Who are the children of the promise? Well, they're after Isaac. And how was Isaac produced? Isaac was produced because God came in and at the time of life and gave life. And Paul shows us that this represents two manners of living. One is called the flesh and one is called the spirit. If we try to live according to the flesh by perfecting the flesh, by law keeping, to try to make ourselves produce the fruit of the spirit, we're actually sowing to the flesh. And instead of bearing the fruit of the spirit, we're going to reap from the flesh corruption manifested in all the works of the flesh. People who start off real religious will eventually go down a road where they're doing all kinds of evil things because they're sowing to the flesh and strengthening it. 
But we, according to the promise, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by the power of the Spirit, he says in Galatians. And that hope of righteousness is for the fruit bearing. So this is not just talking about justification. This is talking about how we live. God's promise for you to be fruitful is going to come to pass. It is going to come to pass. But how do you hinder it? By walking in the flesh, sowing to the flesh, and trying to produce Ishmael. Ishmael put off Isaac for 13 years. When God visited him and said, you're going to have a seed, he went into Hagar and produced Ishmael. And then God didn't talk to him for 13 years. That was a 13-year delay of frustration to the promise of God in which Abraham's household became a house of strife because Hagar was persecuting Sarah, right? Then he finally does have uh, Isaac, but it's after he was circumcised. God gave him the covenant of the circumcision to say, hey, you are not allowed to be helping me in this. It has to be by the Spirit. It has to be in the time of life. It has to come forth not from the flesh, but from the promise. It is my word that brings life to the dead. And that's what we see in the raising of Christ from the dead as the Son of Man, is the faithfulness of God's life-giving word. He is the God who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead. And that's how we're to live. Jesus himself lives in the power of that promise. As the Son of Man, the seed of David, who is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the resurrection from the dead, uh, according to the Holy Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection of the dead, he is the evidence that God's word is guaranteed to be fulfilled and gives life. And he lives in the power of that life that it gives. His flesh does. His flesh is upheld by God's word, by his promise, by his faithfulness. That's what's behind the resurrection of Christ. Yes, according to his divinity, death can't hold him. But according to his humanity, he lives based on the full assurance we have that what God has said he will bring to pass. And that's how we live by faith. We live not reckoning our own body as dead or, or reckoning it dead and saying it's dead. I can't do anything. I'm waiting on you, Lord, to raise me up and renew me. And that's how we live each day. That's what it means to live in newness of life. That's what it means to say, I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I wanted to make that point to, talk, to make it practical, to show, hey, we are not just looking at doctrinal things that are far removed from us, we're looking at how God works. And how God works is how we're supposed to live. We are supposed to live by a realization of how he works. How does he work? He gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are. And how do we live? We live by faith in his promise. What? How do we know his promise is sure? Because he raised up the seed of David and made him the son of God to fulfill his promise. God's promise is so sure that if you die, he'll have to raise you up to fulfill that promise. He had to raise Jesus up. That's one of the reasons he raised the flesh of Jesus up was so that because he had promised, he must sit on David's throne and he's got to fulfill that promise. And you can know that God will work in you by life to uh, bear fruit. But what slows him down? The flesh. What slows God's promise down from being fulfilled is when we sow to the flesh and produce our Ishmael's, we put off Isaac. And that's the problem with Israel, is they tried to establish, they tried to obtain a righteousness, being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're zealous for God, but they tried to establish their own righteousness, and therefore they were rejected and they're out of the land right now. Oh, well, now they're being brought back into the land, not for their sake, but why? Because of his holy name's sake and to fulfill the promise that he made to the fathers. He is bringing them back in and he'll even open their graves to ensure that those dead saints who believed that they would see the Christ in the land of the living uh, and in their land, they'll have that promise fulfilled in the millennium. God is going to fulfill all his promises. What we're watching on the world stage today is the setup for God to demonstrate his faithfulness to his promises in the power of resurrection. And that resurrection is all in a person, Jesus Christ, who is the one who will inherit the nations on behalf of his people and give the land to his people and dispossess the land of its enemies 
and come as the conquering king and establish uh, the Jewish people in their land, even the ones that are dead. He's going to raise them up out of their graves and put them in their land, it says in Ezekiel 36. And he said, you'll know I'm God because I'm going to open your graves and put you in the land. Oh, it's glorious. And we can have the same faith in God today that says, you know what? I have had a whole history of nothing but mess. And then I tried to help God in religion and tried to make my own version of holiness, which just turned out to be a carnal bunch of carnal ordinances by which I judged everybody. It made me more self-righteous. And then I lost the taste of the spirit, lost the enjoyment of my Christian life because I was totally caught up in the religious flesh. And then I backslid and found myself doing things I didn't even think Christians could do and be saved. But then what happened? God brought me back to his promise, which is the, which is the source of life for me. Just like Abraham. Abraham went, tried to help God, went in to Hagar, produced Ishmael, brought all kinds of strife into his house, had 13 years of silence from God. Not a good time. Then what happened? God just reappeared and said, okay, can you see now that this is not working? Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. No, your seed's going to come through Sarah. I'm going to visit her at the time of life. But first, let's talk about this covenant of circumcision. Will you cut off your member as a sign to show that you no longer trust in your strength? That's what circumcision's all about. And God has to wait for us sometimes to circumcise our flesh. On the one hand, our flesh is unclean because of sin, and he dealt with that with the blood. But on the other hand, our flesh is a problem for God because it wants to help him in religious service and try to be holy ourselves through our own strength. And he's got to wait for us to exhaust ourselves. And when he does, he brings us back to the gospel because he did, we, you know, Abraham probably thought I am fully disqualified. My house is a mess, you know, maybe not as bad as we do, but many of us have gone down this road of strengthening our religious flesh, sowing to it, and then reaping a harvest of corruption and getting to a point where we can't even remember how we got saved or if we're saved. Then what God does is he brings us back to the foundation. How do you know you're assured of eternal life? Is it based on you? Or is it based on Christ? Well, I heard the gospel and I believed and God called me righteous. He called those things that are not as though they are. And he sealed me with the spirit, regenerating my spirit and making it life. He gave life to the dead. Oh, that's how I began the Christian life. And then what did I do? Well, having begun in the spirit, I tried to perfect myself in the flesh. That's what Galatians is about. This is called Galatianism. Uh, he says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? Does he who supply, how did you receive the spirit? Was it through the hearing of faith or by the works of the law? It was by the hearing of faith. Well, as you've received the Lord, so walk in him. You need to be rooted and grounded in the faith that you first received. Continuing in the Christian life is no different than how you began it. How did Abraham begin his walk? God called him out. God visited to him and gave him faith and strength to leave everything behind. Abraham's life was a series, a series of God visitations to him, appearing to him, elaborating on his promises that he had promised him in the beginning. And that was the motivation and the strength for Abraham to move forward. And whenever there was silence, he parked, went back down into Egypt. You know, it took him a long time. What was that time spent doing? Was it failure? Not from God's point of view. It was he was waxing strong in faith and giving glory to God. See, when you read Romans 4, you don't see all the mistakes. You see Abraham waxing strong in faith, giving glory to God. Why? Because that's what God was doing. He was growing Abraham in his faith, even though it looks like a series of parked places and failures and slowing God down. So on the one hand, we do slow God down with our religious efforts. But on the other hand... He's saying, no, I'm waxing, you're waxing strong in faith and growing to give, learn to give glory to God and be firmly persuaded that I give life to the dead and I fulfill my promises and I'm showing you my faithfulness. And that is the path to fruit bearing and holiness, not trying to be holy in the flesh. So this comes right down to our practical Christian life. How do we live by the hearing of faith, by the supply of the spirit? 
by God's promise and by believing that God is able to give life to the dead. That's what it means to walk in newness of life. Not trying to be alive, not trying to live for God, but believing what God's done. And what is that work? Where is that work most concentrated? In the death and resurrection of Christ. That's why we're admonished to always come back to the beginning. We keep studying the death and resurrection of Christ again and again and again from different angles so that we can see God's working and how he's doing it because that's how we live. For me to live is Christ. And how do I live him? Well, I got to eat and drink him. Unless you eat and drink my flesh, you have no life in you. So that's our fellowship. We continue in the fellowship and the teaching of the apostles and the breaking of bread. And that's our life. Our life is just to behold Christ and believe in him and give glory to him and thank him for what he's said and what he'll do. And that is what holiness ends up looking like. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that your culture is going to change and you're going to be go from being a barbarian to a Greek. And that's what we've got right now in the community is that people are trying to impose ordinances on people based on culture. You know, well, if you were really holy, you'd be more proper like me. You wouldn't just throw your bones on the ground like that and lie out under the stars and not take a bath. <laughs> you barbarian. You'd be a Greek and you'd read proper literature and you'd speak well and you would be uh, living, you'd, you know, take a bath every day. I mean, that's all cultural. And you think, well, that's just a joke. No, that was a real problem in the church. In the early church, the barbarians, the Scythians, the Greeks, the Jews with their various culture, which had all these ordinances, they thought that their culture was what made them holy. And they tried to impose it on each other. And that broke fellowship and created enmity, which is a kind of hatred. You know, when you live by ordinances, what you're really saying is this is just an excuse for me to hate you in a more fancy way. <laughs> so what is the answer? Well, we have to reckon ourselves dead and realize that holiness is not in the realm of that stuff. Holiness has to do with sanctifying the Lord of my heart and fixing my gaze on him and God's promise and being willing to wait for him to manifest his life in me and also in others. And so we don't make demands on people's flesh. We point them to the promise of the spirit. There's one kind of ministry that that makes demands on people's flesh, and it's actually a form of persecution from Ishmael. And then there is another kind of ministry which points them to the death and resurrection of Christ and says, look what God does. Believe on him. And that is produced from the children of promise. That's what we are. That's what we want to be. Okay. Well, again, a tangent. But I like these tangents. Okay, so then the third reason he, he rose from the dead is to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. This comes from Ephesians 1.22, uh, and I love this. It says um, where he prays, you know, that we may have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. And he talks about three things, that we would know what is the hope of his calling, where we would know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and then what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Now I said that, Jesus, his resurrection is based on the promise, the power in the promise, right? According to his humanity as the seed of David, he's going to come and reign in that power. But that power also raised him up above everything, every name that is named. Not He was already that as a God, as the son of God in Trinity past, the angels worshiped him. But the ancient of days, you know, but this is the son of man who has been exalted and how is he upheld in the highest of uh in in the heavens above everything in the power of resurrection in the power of god fulfilling his promise by the working of his own life god's word is his life god's word is christ god's word is the son of god um and he's upheld in that power 
And by that power, he has putting everything under his feet and given him to be head over all things. So uh, to the church. So, yes, he's coming as the seat of David to possess that throne. But even more right now, we don't see him reigning, but we see him in the heavens seated at the right hand of God. And what is he there? He's the high priest for the body of Christ, and he's the head of the body of Christ. He's head over all things to work everything together for your good. Every single situation in your life as a son of God, now that you're regenerated, and even up until the time you were regenerated to lead you to that place, is in God's hand by the power of resurrection to ensure that you are brought into fellowship with Christ and eventually into glory. And there's not a single situation in your life that is not under the headship of Christ by his power in resurrection. You might not believe it because you have all kinds of things in your life that you think are adverse to you. Problems. But God says he's working all those things together for good. He is weaving them into a story of Christ in your life. He's using your weakness. He's using your foolishness. He's using your mistakes. He's using the mistakes of the people around you. He's using the interactions and reactions between and the dynamic and the relationships that just seem like failure and mess to bring you to a place of circumcision where you say, I can do nothing. Okay. Christ has to be everything. That's what it means to be headed up in Christ and for Christ to be head over all things to you. We we're talking about that in Colossians, that it means that Christ is the way you learn to handle everything. And none of us know how to do this. It's to bring you into the spirit so that you're living as Christ. That's why you've got problems in your life. Uh, that's why you've got things that seem contrary to you. That's why you've got some weaknesses still. Call it a thorn in his flesh, a messenger sent from Satan to buffet him, so that everywhere he went, he had to rely on the power of God. Because no matter where he went, there was strife, division, rioting, big groups of people coming after him. I mean, it was ridiculous. Read the book of Acts and read Corinthians where he describes this. He said it was a, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him so that he would not trust in his flesh, but in the excellency of the power of God who gives life to the dead. He, we all have that in a miniature. At some level, there are situations in your life that are designed to keep you from having confidence in yourself. Why? Is it because he wants to show you how bad you are? No. It's because he wants you to learn to transfer your trust from your strength to God's promise and to live in resurrection. That's what it means for Christ to be head over all things to the church is that he is sovereignly arranging for all these things in your life while giving you life and renewing your inner man and bringing you into the knowledge of himself. That's his position now. He's head over all things to the church. And even though we live in this world, in this toxic stew, and we have our flesh and our foolishness and our mistakes and our problems, the reality is we need a vision of Christ as head over all things to the church. And we don't see it with our eyes, but we walk by faith. And that's really what it means to walk by faith. It's like I'm Christ's responsibility. I'm his responsibility. You know, the last couple of days I've had all kinds of things attack me. It, uh, my own weakness, my own offense, people, uh, a couple of relationships falling apart where you're really grieved. And then you're like, what did they just say? Where is that coming from? And you're mystified and you can't talk to them. And you're like, oh man, it's a mess. And, and then you're, you're just in your flesh. You're just like, what, why, you know, and it's so hard to pray. Well, guess what? Christ is the head of the body. And he's the high priest. And as the head and the life of the body, he makes he ever lives to make intercession for us. And he is within us, touched with the feeling of our weakness, and he intercedes for us. Now, the weakness itself is brought about under his sovereign care. You know, he doesn't lead us into temptation, but he allows all the situations in our life to refine us. And the refining isn't to get us to learn how to mind our P's and Q's. The refining is for us to be brought out of the realm of the flesh and trusting in its resources and to trust in him so that he can renew us and keep us in newness of life. The way of the Christian life is weakness because of the headship of Christ. 
we have a different kind of spirituality than what's represented in the New Apostolic Reformation and the Keth and the Charismatics and the even the Calvinists. You know, they all rely on their own strength. One one, one person I was talking to said, "What's the difference between uh, us and some of these dreamers and stuff?" Well, the dreamers count on their ability to discern and know what's from God and what's from what's not from God. And they just know themselves so well, and they're absolutely convinced they've heard from God, and they absolutely know better. And if it contradicts the word, it doesn't matter because my feeling was so strong. They trust in their feelings and their flesh. We have no confidence in our flesh. I don't know what if I heard from God or not. And you see that in Second Corinthians when Paul is addressing them. He says, look, I repented of that letter I wrote you, but now I don't repent because I found out from Titus that you were you were actually affected by it and you were brought to godly sorrow i'm so happy now but i did repent he wasn't so sure that everything he did was right we do not trust in ourselves and whether we did the right thing we trust in christ i'm crucified with him i'm under the blood maybe i made a mistake yesterday maybe i didn't handle that right but that is not how he's measuring me what he's measuring is how much christ do i have and how much more does he need to intercede for me to make sure that I'm brought more and more into him and not myself. We have a high priest who's faithful over all this and a head who's faithful over all this. And he's absolutely sovereign. So these last couple of days of confusion for me, he's not holding that against me. He's like, praise God, I brought you into that. And then I interceded for you and I renewed you. And it's interesting because in that confusion, the way I got through was to do these messages. And every time I do, there's just such a flow that renews me and brings me into strength. And I know that he does that because he wants these things not to just be information or dry doctrinal knowledge, but spirit and life. And I get feedback from people who are saying, man, that fed me. And when I look back at many of my situations over the last two years, when I did messages, when I got the most feedback of, wow, that blessed me. I was in the most amount of weakness in my personal life, confusion, fear and trembling, and what's going on, Lord, where are you? It's very interesting. Christ is head over all things to the church. And he is there. He was raised from the dead to be. And that's permanent. Head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is how he works himself into the church. By bringing us into weakness and then working us into us. And this, working himself into us. And I said this again in a Second Corinthians message. Don't despise this time we live in. We want so bad to be in the next age. But we're not going to have this kind of spirituality in the next age. Of Christ working himself into you through weakness. That is a mystery that even the angels can't understand. They're like, how can these weak clay vessels live Christ? The Son of God. The Ancient of Days, the Alpha and Omega is being expressed in them and they don't even know it. If they could see the, the weight of glory that's being wrought into them while they learn to look, not at those things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. These momentary light afflictions are not worthy to be compared to the weight of glory that's being wrought into us. Uh, when we are in resurrection, we will see the glory that was wrought into us through all these situations that felt not like strength and victory, but felt like weakness and failure. Because we have the first fruits of the Spirit, because we have the high priest in us who's the head of his body, who's touched with the feelings of our infirmity, because he interceded in our weakness and caused us to groan within and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, save me from myself. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And in that moment of weakness, it's death working in you, but life often in others. And oftentimes I'm in that kind of weakness while I give these messages. And it's power. And the way I know it is not because I feel powerful, but because people come back to me and say, oh my gosh, that blessed me. That was like the best message you've ever given. Why? I didn't feel it. <laughs> it's because this is how God works in this age. He does not work by bringing you into a place where you are super powerful and gifted. He brings you into a place where you are the true circumcision. You have no confidence in your flesh. You're serving by the Spirit and boasts in Christ Jesus. And it's the difference between the dogs 
and the circumcision and the Ishmaelites and the people of the flesh versus the children of the promise, the true circumcision, those who have no confidence in their flesh. That's where he's bringing us to an end of our own confidence. That's the theme of this message. I guess I, that's, I didn't think I, that's what I was going to talk about, but that's how this stuff intersects with our life. Okay. So that was the third point. Uh, I got to get my kids some lunch.